Good morning. Why don't you stand with us today? We're going to worship our God. If you're joining us online today and uh, you're here with us for the first time, you're going to see a button in your chat. It says, new here. Do us a favor, click on that button. We want to connect with you. And we want to send you a gift just to appreciate you for worshiping with us today. And uh, if you're online and you need prayer today, you're going to see another button in your chat. It says, request prayer. And if you click on that button, one of our prayer team will, will join you confidentially and we'll be happy, we'll be honored to pray with you, intercede for you, and believe with you in a God who answers prayers. Church, how many of you today are, are, are grateful for the faithfulness of our God? Amen? He is a good and faithful God. Yeah, you can clap in this house today. There's freedom to do that here today. We worship you, our God. And we're thankful for your faithfulness. We're thankful for your love and kindness, God. And we worship you, and we worship you, and we worship you, Lord our God. And I am holding on to faith. Because I know you'll make a way. And I don't always understand, and I don't always get to see, but I will believe it, yes, I will believe it, because you make mountains move, you make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls, and I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Yes, you are forever faithful, God. We believe in your today. We bless you. We bless you. And I am standing on your word.
You're worthy of our worship today, oh God. No one else deserves a praise. No one else deserves a worship, Lord. We exalt you. We exalt you. We magnify you. We lift you up, our King. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Thank you, God And Jesus, the only name with other names and Jesus the only one who could ever say
We believe in you. We believe in you. Worship you. you know, Psalm 66 says, it says, come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. And church, whenever I, whenever I think about the amazing things that God has done, the amazing miracles that he's done, I'm, I'm filled with joy, I'm overwhelmed. Does, any, does anyone else hear me today? Does anyone else know what I mean? And it doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter what my circumstance is. When I'm in the driest place, I can look to the word. I can, I can think of the amazing miracles he's worked in my life and remind myself of the great things that God has done and be, and be rejoiceful. Be rejoiceful in that dry place. I can worship in that dry place. And so I just encourage any of you this morning, if you're in that place this morning, reflect on what the Lord has done. He's good. He's faithful. Amen? He's faithful. Oh, you are faithful. Yeah, let's worship him today. His faithfulness. We exalt you and we thank you because you can do anything and you've done everything. You are faithful, God. So, so faithful. throughout my history your faithfulness is walked beside me the winter storms make way for spring in every season from where I'm standing and I see
Why should we fear? And why should we fear when the evidence is here? Oh, why? And why should we fear when the evidence is here? Come on, just thank him for his faithfulness, Jim. Psalms 136 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, because his steadfast love endures forever. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? amen? Circumstances and things in life may change, but God does not change. His love never changes. It never wavers. Circumstances, our feelings, our feelings can change with the weather, but God is constant, and his love for you never changes, never changes. We're going to go to prayer, and we have uh, some things we want to pray for. There are, of course, some in our congregation dealing with health issues. We want to continue to pray for them. Some of you may have heard that Reverend Lori Gibbons passed away uh, this last week. Uh, Lori had just retired just over a month from being our... Um, uh, district superintendent, and he had served as a regional director. He's, um, we've known him for 40 years and passed away suddenly in his sleep. We want to pray for the family, Debbie and the boys, their families, as they, uh, as they process this, this time. But God's love never changes, amen? And I knew my friend, and his faith and his trust in God. He's rejoicing. We need to pray for those who are grieving. There are others here, I'm sure, and dealing with the world issues and all that's going on. I know there are some that are connected to some of the things that are happening around the world. And we may be here, but God's spirit is there. And we need to pray that God would be with them and lead them and guide them. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for who you are, almighty, true, and good, and that your love, your faithfulness never changes. God, we can give testimony. Many of us have experienced that in our lives, have known your love, your mercy, your grace, the peace that comes even in the midst of turmoil, loss, and grief. And so, God, we give you thanks and we give you praise because you are worthy. We lift up those right now, whether they're here or, or other places that God are dealing with issues of health, that, God, you administer, that, God, may they sense your presence right now when we speak healing in Jesus' name. According to your word and our faith and trust in you, God, strengthen and heal lives. We pray for those like the Gibbon family dealing with grief and loss. And we pray, God, your peace to rest on them. As many of our churches will be praying for them today, God, we join with them and pray that the family would sense and know your love and comfort and peace and the strength that comes in resting in you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Lord, our world needs you. It's always needed you, but it needs you 
so much right now. There is so much hurting, so much going on in our world, so many people affected by turmoil and conflicts around the world. God, I pray your presence to enter into these places of, of violence and destruction, and God, may your light shine. I pray for your people, your church, and these places that, God, they would be empowered by your spirit and that within them would arise a faith and trust that, God, your love never changes, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and may, God, you uphold them and, and raise them up that they would be a light in their communities and that people, God, who are struggling and suffering right now, that, God, they would be drawn to you that their hearts would be softened, and God, that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior, that even in the midst of conflict and violence, that God, you can do something good. You can accomplish your will, your plan, your purpose, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. We're glad you're here today. We've got a, a video that we're going to show right now. All right. Okay. Here's a question. Do you believe you have a personal responsibility to share your faith? Surveys have shown that the overwhelming majority of us would answer yes. Okay. So what about this question? Have you shared your faith with anyone in the last six months? Surveys have shown that a majority of us would answer this question, no. I guess it's just not as easy as it seems or at least as easy as we would like it to be. Well, here's another question. How many times have you personally invited a new person to church? Now, this seems simple, right? And yet surveys tell us that almost half of us would answer zero. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we don't invite them, right? Maybe it still feels a little awkward and uncomfortable. Or maybe we're just unsure how effective it is. Or we just expect to hear them say no. So listen to this. When people are asked why they came to church in the first place, the vast majority of them say, I began attending because someone invited me. The main thing that got most of us through the door the first time was an invitation. Easter will soon be here. It's the perfect Sunday to share with others what your faith is all about. And it can all start with one more simple question. Want to come to church on Sunday? Let's change the stats and let God change hearts and lives this Easter. And let's start with something simple, an invitation. We're really excited uh, about this Easter. Actually, it was a year ago on Good Friday that we had our first in-person service in the church, and we were excited to be here. We have uh, made up some invitation cards and they're going to be available after the service to pick one up and take them or pick up a pack and pass them out. Invite someone, a friend, a neighbor, someone you know to come with you for Easter. And uh, we're just really excited about being able to do this and help a little bit to make it easier. And um, it's a great way just to introduce people to the gospel of Christ. Um, also today, please take note that church deacon board nominations are available out in the foyer after the service. And today is also the nomination, uh, uh, the last day for nominations and the, um, for the annual business meeting coming up on April 24th. Uh, there's also a table set out for small groups. If you're not part of a small group, we really want to encourage you to join one of our groups. And there's a table out there in the back, uh, out in the foyer, that you can sign up. We have uh, seven or eight groups. Sorry, my memory's uh, going. No comments. And, um, uh, and so please join us in a small group. Today is also a special missions team meeting. We are setting up a committee for our missions, oversee our missions and help with missions, and we'll be meeting after the service in the um, uh, preschool room. 
Seniors, young at heart, I know maybe none of you really fit in that category here today, but if you know someone, we're having our first event. We've started this new group, Young at Heart, and we are having a luncheon next Saturday here at the church at 11 o'clock. There's information and also sign up out in the foyer today, all right? Uh, Easter Missions Project, we are really excited about... Um, being able to help our community and we have a nursing home that we're able to gather some items that they need that could help them and we're going to start doing that next week and then easter sunday uh if you have or please purchase uh um, adult sun hats baseball caps socks uh new socks thank you uh kleenexes uh boxes of uh, body wash or containers of body wash and lotion uh an individual wrapped chocolate and candy we're going to have a table out there uh, over the next couple of weeks and if you can bring those in it's just a great way to help one of our nursing homes uh, with these items. Good Friday service is coming up April 15th, 10 a.m. It'll be a communion service, and we're going to be joining with New Creation Church, who meet here in the afternoons, and we're excited about that. Um, and if you've forgotten anything that I've said, if you've tuned me out already, all right, you can sign up for our newsletter. All the information's there, and you can also look online. If you're visiting with us today, if this is your first time visiting or if you've never signed up for uh, being a visitor, we just have a small gift for you. You can do that at guest services. We're really excited that you're here with us and uh, hope you'll do that. And again, we want to thank you for your faithfulness in uh, tithes and offerings over this last time. And there are many ways that you can give both online and here after the service as well. We're going to dismiss the children. I did not forget. And also our junior highs are starting today and they can also be dismissed at this time. Pastor Fraz. Have fun kiddos. You can have a great time, great time today. Good morning everyone and welcome to Heartland uh, Church Connected. So glad you guys could uh, be here and join us online. It's an exciting day today. I saw some, I, I, no, I'm not gonna, we're not going to go into snow. We're not going to go into snow. Hey, before we get into the message, wanted to give you a bit of a special announcement. Um, I, I was talking to the team many, many months ago, and even as we were doing our strat plan, um, one of the things that kept coming up in the strat plan was one day we knew we needed to have some sort of computer expertise on staff. For those of you who are a little bit more like me and you're not overly computer inclined, a lot of what you see happening here is run by computers. Did you know that? Yeah, I mean, there's no computers in here yet, hopefully, ever. But a lot of what you see is computers. I mean, I don't know even know which camera is on right now. There's a red light here. That's a computer behind that camera right now. And all throughout the week, our entire streaming ministry is all computers. And so as we were praying and talking through our strategic plan, uh, if you remember, one of them was this idea of online engagement and, and revamping our website. In fact, we have a, a volunteer who's going to beautify our website, revamp it, but, you know, said in the most loving way possible that you're going to have to, you know, I'll build it for you, but then you got to take it. And you, and you have to, you have to keep it going. And, uh, and so every, and not only computers, but, you know, there's this other word called a server. And apparently it's important. <laughs> Who knew? And so anyway, we, you know, we, we knew this. And so we, I was praying, and, and I thought of, 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 a, of a person many, many, many months ago. But, you know, just because you think of a name doesn't mean you do anything, right? And so anyway, uh, long story short, you know, uh, the name kind of popped up again. I, 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 you know, maybe in hindsight, I think it was a God conversation. And so I, I, I took this individual out for lunch, and I said, hey, we have computers, and the Lord has given you a gift in that area. W would you consider would you consider being here and, and helping us not not blow this place up and and honestly not just the fact that we have IT and computer stuff today. The truth is that through our online ministries and our website, currently we are reaching people we've never reached before. And I believe by faith, we're going to continue to reach people we have never reached before, amen? That there is actually a, a human being, a never dying soul on the other side of the screen, on the other side of your phone, somewhere in the GTA or the world. So anyway, I took him out uh, for lunch and, and we talked, we prayed, we laughed, and, and, and he eventually said yes. And uh, so I, I am 
am pleased to announce that we have hired an IT ministry director. If you've been coming for more than, you know, eight to 10 years, you, you probably already know this name. Uh, it's Nicholas Eidstrom, and his wife Tina is here. Yeah, give him a hand. Yeah, why don't you guys stand? Say hi. Uh, you guys can grab a seat. Nick, welcome to the team. But Nick, Tina, and, and daughter, I, you know, in a lot of ways, welcome back home. Um, honestly, like, you belong here. And, and we're excited to have you here, and we're excited to have you be a part of the team. Uh, Nick wrote this wonderful bio, born in Sweden, grew up in Kingston, lives in Mississauga, met his wife, Tina, on his fifth. How many mission trips have you done? Nine, nine. There might be missions ministry somewhere in your portfolio in the future. Uh, but met his wife on his fifth mission trip. His daughter, their daughter, Annika, is in Guelph University. He graduated from the University of Toronto with an honors bachelor degree in computer science. And so he knows how to do stuff on computers. He studied theology at Horizon College, music at Providence College. He's an all-around great guy. And because he is so musical, we said, hey, like, if you're going to be here, you know, why don't you help us out musically and streaming and whatnot. So you'll see him on the stage a couple of times a month and kind of out and about. And so we're really happy to have you here. And we're just excited. Uh, well, I'm personally excited that no one's going to be asking me to fix the server. And so, but more than that, you know, uh, I think we've become friends and I, I feel in my heart that you'll be a great fit on the team, but I, I, and I already know you'll be a great fit in this church. So we're excited about that. We are starting a brand new series today called Living in the New. How many people here are ready to live in something new? That you don't necessarily want to live in something old, but you're ready to live in something new. In fact, I've been hearing a lot about new. People are getting excited about going back out into the real world and living their lives once again and doing the kinds of things that they used to do. And I've been hearing this phrase quite a bit on TV. I've been reading it in papers and articles, going back to your pre-pandemic life. Anyone even remember what your pre-pandemic looked like, your life looked like? I don't even know what I did. I, I, I know I was there because I'm here today, so obviously I was there, but going back to your pre-pandemic life and going back to all the wonderful and fun things you used to do. But as I was thinking about this, this idea of going back to my pre-pandemic life and going back to, you know, all the, the wonderful things that, that we used to do, I started reflecting and realizing that while there are some things that I really do want to go back to, there are some things that I absolutely, under no conditions, want to go back to in my life, that there are elements of my pre-pandemic life, there are character traits of my pre-pandemic life, there are habits in my pre-pandemic life that, to be honest, I don't really want to go back to. And so, uh, I don't know if you feel that way, but just for me, here are some things that I do not want to go back to. I discovered how inefficient I was in some areas of my life. And I do not want to go back to that inefficiency. Now, maybe you read that statement and you might be thinking, oh, well, Pastor Fraz doesn't want to waste time so he can do more work m more effectively. And that's not actually what I mean. Part of the problem of wasting time isn't so much that you don't get as much work done, but it's that you start taking work home and you deprive yourself of the Sabbath rest you actually need. God created you for rest. And really the irony of that first point is that, like as a part of my doctorate work, I'm, I'm working on the benefits of, sab of Sabbath rest, rest by, by doing leadership correctly. And I've, I've written on it academically, I've preached on it, and the great irony is that at least when I wrote this and over these past two years, I wasn't living it. I wasn't living this concept of Sabbath rest. And large, I mean, some factors I couldn't control, like COVID, obviously. But there were other factors that were within my control, and I just wasn't efficient. And so as I think about going back to my pre-pandemic life, I don't want to go back to that mode of working where I did not create the margin I needed to truly rest. I don't want any part of it. I have a greater understanding of what energizes me and what drains me. Computer stuff drains me, Nick. It drains me to no end. Uh, you know, I, I say that jokingly, but you know, when, when the stuff doesn't work and everyone's looking at you and like it's all online and you're thinking, oh my goodness, like, do you remember the days where all you needed was a Bible and like a good story and like maybe an altar call and you were done, right? 
Like now, like, do you, anyone remember those days? I think they used to happen. And, and please don't get me wrong, I, I love the vibrancy of ministry today, but it, it can be draining at times. But I've learned about me what really fills me and energizes me about ministry. And so for me personally, I allow my giftings to lean into those areas because I know it fills me with a sense of value and excitement. I, I've learned or realized that some of my priorities that I used to have, I should not have had. That I should in fact have newer, better priorities, that some of those old priorities should not exist. And so while I'm excited to go back to my pre-pandemic life, there are some things that I absolutely do not want to go back to. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I am very excited with wisdom and in caution and in light of lessons learned. I am very excited to move forward and do the things we used to do. My kids have been tugging at my leg for the past like month. They want to go to the movies. Like the movies, what is that? Like, the, you know, that, the, the screen and the popcorn and, and, and the pop and all that. There's a, a movie about like this like porcupine or hedgehog and he's blue and he runs really fast and like, and my kids want to just run everywhere and they're like, we got to go watch it. I'm like, all right. And I, th I already know what's going to happen. My wife's going to sit at the one end and I'm going to sit at the other and they're going to be staring at the screen and we're going to have our phones like recording them watching a movie. We're going to be making a movie and then watching a movie. But honestly, we're excited about that, to, to do that, you know, without a mask and, and to eat popcorn and drink pop and all the rest of it and, and miss half the movie because we've got four kids and, you know, we got to go to the bathroom four times and we're excited about that. And as excited as we are about our pre-pandemic life, we recognize that while some of it was good, there are some things that are just not worth going back to. I am ready. I don't know about you, but I am ready to experience something new. And I hope, I pray, and I plead that the same is true for you. Because I think you would admit, if you were really, really honest, that there are, well, maybe reluctantly admit, that there are some areas of your life, there are some habits that you used to have, thought patterns that perhaps you developed in these two years that you know are unhealthy. And the worst thing you could do is go back to them. In fact, I would even wager to say that the, the unhealthy thought patterns that really took root already existed before the two, three year mark, but they just intensified. That, that the cynicism that kind of just peaked up its head every once in a while, it, it became your dominant character trait. The, 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 the lingering doubt you had as to whether or not God was good or even real became this almost headlong jump into apostasy. And while there are some good things, many good things about your pre-pandemic life, I am ready for something new. But where do you find it? Where do you find this something new that God has in store for you? And, and the interesting part about this question is Jesus revealed that to his listeners, but they struggled with really receiving it because the new that he offers you can't be found in the typical places where you buy things. Things, you know, things in the typical places you buy things will eventually decay, they'll rot, and they'll waste away. They will get old. And the new that God has in store for you and for those around you is a kind of new that you can't find in a thing, but you can only find in him. He is the light of this new life. And if you are not living in what he had in store for you before the pandemic, then dear God, don't go back to your pre-pandemic life exactly the way it used to be. There is something new and vibrant and fresh that he wants to do in your life. In fact, I, I was thinking of this even today. I was just praying and doing some of my own devotions, and, and I came across a, a verse I've read like a bazillion times. It's Lamentations chapter 3. And just to give you a context, it's not on the screen, but Lamentations chapter 3. Jerusalem has fallen, and God's people have been exiled to Babylon. And in light of their broken lives, this is what God says. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new each and every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. That there is something ahead of you. And you can't let what's behind you, whether that's fear or doubt, get in the way of what he has put before you. And so in this passage we're about to read, there's actually three groups of people. There are the disciples who are like the true blue believers. There are those who just started to believe. They haven't really figured everything out. They, you know, maybe they couldn't explain the Trinity, but, but they've just started to believe. And then there was this group of people called the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders. And so Jesus makes this incredible statement that he is the light of life, that he is offering something that no one else can offer. And instead of receiving and believing what he wanted to offer them while well, I just couldn't do it for a lot of reasons and we'll get into that in a few moments so we're going to read from John chapter 8 we're going to start in verse 12 read till verse 19 read verse 30 but I want you to know that that this message today was informed and prayerfully reflected on throughout the entire chapter but the entire chapter has 60 verses and so we're going to read about eight or nine and we'll refer to others as we go along so this is john chapter 8 starting in verse 12 again jesus spoke to them saying i am the light of the world whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life and when i read that phrase it reminded me of when God's people were fleeing or running for their lives from Egyptian slavery. Remember Moses, let my people go. They're gone, they're, they're running away, and Moses has a change of heart, so his armies are chasing down the Israelite people. And in the evening, they continued to run, but in the evening, they had this pillar of fire, this pillar of light in front of them that guided them to safety and salvation. And, and it's just, it was the picture, right? Because even in this verse, he says, will not follow, or go back one slide, will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And even as they were fleeing from Egypt, you have the darkness that's literally behind them because the light's ahead of them. You have this army that's trying to destroy them. And ahead of them, you have this pillar of light, this light that leads to actual physical life. And, and in a lot of ways, it's as if Jesus is saying, if you follow me, if you follow the light of my new life in you, I can save you from what the darkness represents. That's a, quite the audacious claim. And some were interested, but the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, they, they just couldn't stand it. And so they start trying to dismantle what he's saying. And this is their response. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Meaning because you're the one saying this about you, why should we believe you? You need more than one person to testify on your behalf. They're referring to the law in Deuteronomy chapter 17 that says you need two or three witnesses at least. And so the Pharisees are saying, you don't have any witnesses, so why should we believe you? And so Jesus replies, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. What a statement, huh? Do, do you know where you come from? Do, do you actually know where you're going? But you do not know where, I'm, where I come from or where I am going. You know, it's almost as if his words are an invitation to a different kind of life. Because when you look at that phrase, I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. It's, it's those existential questions of life, aren't they? Of origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Where do I come from? Why am I here? How am I supposed to live? And how does it end? Like, do you actually know the answers to these questions? Because if you don't, I would say to you, your life is needlessly empty. And so when he says these words, it's as if his words are an invitation. I know where I come from, 
and I know where I'm going. And if you receive the light of my life, if you receive the new things that I want to do in you, you can know where you come from, and you can know your purpose in life, and you can know where you're going. And then he says these words. He says, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. One of the reasons why they rejected Jesus as the Messiah is because he did not come with the typical fanfare associated with kings and leaders and politicians. He had this, like literally this humble physique, this humble garb. There was nothing about him that made you go, wow, that is a person of stature. That is a person of wealth. That is a, per that is a person of position. His life embodied humbleness. It embodied humility. In fact, I would dare say that many, if not all, of the great things that God wants to do in your life will not start with fanfare and with decorations, but they'll start in humility. They'll start with humble beginnings. It's like when Jesus said that a mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds, but it grows into this great big tree. That's the kingdom of God. That the great kingdom work he wants to do in you may not look like much in the beginning, but it'll become extravagant and life-giving and incredible. But they couldn't, they couldn't believe it. They, couldn't, they just couldn't get over the fact that this person is who he says he is, let alone offer the kind of light that frees you from the power of darkness. That's the whole point of the passage, that first verse. And all the rest of it is, is these Pharisees arguing with Jesus. There's just no way we can believe you. And so then Jesus goes on to say, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, this is Deuteronomy 17, Old Testament, in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. So all Jesus has to do is find two people. Why, well, that can't be hard, right? I mean, you got Peter, you got James, you got John. Hey, there's people there. There's a, I mean, we'll get into the crowd that was there. There's a lot of people there. And yet, out of all the people that were there, <laughs> look at the two he listed. He's not being cheeky. Like, this isn't some sort of a, you know, cosmic religious joke, right? He says, I am the one who bears witness about myself, uno, one, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me, two. And, and, and it's not on the screen, and we won't, we won't read it, but later on in John chapter 8, Jesus actually references a third witness, Moses, who's been dead for over a thousand years. And the implication is, well, when I was in heaven sitting on the throne, Moses was there worshiping me, rejoicing me at the day that would come. And the implication, not just Moses, but all the heavenly hosts saw me. You know, I, uh, being a young adult pastor, I, I've often uh, had coffee. Well, not that it's anything to do with young people, but just kind of, we, we were in a lot of universities, and so, and we were looking for opportunities to talk to people who did not believe. And, and one of the things that often came up was, well, Jesus was just a good guy. He was just a good teacher. And, and, and I, would, I would go to these passages going, well, this is how he thought about himself. H how could a good teacher think this way about himself? Like if, I, if you said to me, well, pastor, like, like, why do you think your idea is so great? Well, because I and the Father are one. And the angels in heaven, they, 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 they've got my back. Yeah, which angels? Well, the ones that worshiped me when I was there and still worship me today. Like, I'd be brushing off the old resume, right? Like, that people don't talk like that. And, and this was actually his self-perception. He perceived himself as the one who had the authority to give you the light that gives you freedom from the power of darkness. And you might be thinking, well, like, why not just ignore this nut job, right? Like, why ignore him? Well, how do you ignore somebody who heals people miraculously in public, how, how do you ignore someone where, where there are people who are actually lame and you can see they're lame and they're being healed? Just a few chapters earlier, he miraculously, supernaturally fed 5,000 plus people. How do you ignore somebody who does that? They can't ignore him. And, 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 but this was their attempt. Verse 19, they said to him, therefore, well, where is your father? Thinking they're going to trap him, right? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, 
you would know my father also. Implication being, you would know the life that he and I are offering you. The light that gives you freedom from the power of darkness. This new life, this new eternal life that could be a wellspring of life that just bubbles forth out of you. If you knew my father, you would know me. If you know me, you know my father. And if you receive me, what I'm promising you would be yours. We're going to read one more verse. Um, much of the chapter is all about Jesus, I don't want to say argument, but, but very technical legal conversations with the Pharisees. But in the middle of all this, there were, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Not the Pharisees, but there was a crowd there. Jesus, I mean, there were miracles that were done in private, but I mean, feeding 5,000 plus people was a big one. And so there was a huge crowd there wondering, like, who is this guy? Because we don't understand how he can do the things that he can do. And so in the middle of all this, as he was talking, there were those who believed. Everyone had the opportunity to believe. Everyone had the opportunity to walk away from a life of darkness. Everyone had the opportunity to receive the new light, the new life that Jesus was offering every single human being. But not everyone took that opportunity because the Pharisees rejected it. They fought it. And I would say in today's message, really, if I could just say it really simply, is don't, don't fight the light. Don't fight the light of new life. Don't fight the new thing that God wants to do in your life. Now, here's, here's the catch. The, the new thing isn't found in a thing, you know, in those typical places where you buy things. It's found in him. He doesn't just tell you about the light. He is the physical embodiment of truth and of light and life. Don't fight it. It's easy to. I think there are many who struggle with who Jesus is. Many who struggle with the kinds of things that he said. And, and maybe you know someone, maybe you are someone, you would say, look, I'm, I'm not necessarily against church. I think church is a good thing, you know. I don't know if I believe, but I want my kids to go to church because maybe they won't be weird and they'll be normal and they'll meet somebody, blah, 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 blah. But, but I'm just not sure I believe. I, I have a little bit of doubt. And, and if you do feel that way or if you know someone who feels that way, well, don't fret. You're in good company. The Pharisees had doubt. In fact, I would dare say that every journey towards faith starts in doubt. Every journey. Like nobody comes out of the womb believing. Every journey towards faith starts in doubt. Nobody comes out of the womb saved. I had doubt. You had doubt. Everyone has doubt. You know, when you read this passage, it's easy to think that Jesus is framing it as a cosmic battle between good and evil and dark and light. And, and somehow these religious leaders or Pharisees are, are the, the big, bad, mean, bad guys, right? Like the, 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 the mean wolf who huffs and puffs and, and blows everything away. When in reality, Jesus loved everybody in that crowd. He loved the disciples who believed. He loved those who just started to believe. And he even loved those who could not believe but were filled with confusion and doubt and probably some other things as well, which we'll talk about. But he loved them as well because he knew then and he knows today, and I think you need to hear it, that every journey towards faith starts in doubt. I mean, some of you have made this journey towards faith, but it began in doubt. Now, some of you made it quickly. Some of you might be thinking, well, I never really doubted. Well, that's because you've been coming to church for a really long time, and you don't remember when you didn't believe. We have a saying in church, maybe you've heard it before, born in a pew. Anyone heard that before, born in the pew? Yeah, it doesn't actually happen. We, we won't, we'll, we'll, we'll call an ambulance for you, don't worry. Um, but uh, born, born in a pew. Uh, my, our kids, oh, we have four kids, and, and I tell you, like, they, the only life they've ever known is church. Like, even though they go to school, and even though they have all these other things that they do, like th th their mind revolves around this day. And I hope and pray that they come to know the Lord for themselves one day, but this is all they've ever known. And so, you know, maybe you have a similar experience or your kids do where they would say, well, I don't ever remember not believing. Well, it's just because it happened quickly. That's all. 
And there are others of you, and, and it was a very slow journey where you really wrestled that you maybe came for years, maybe decades, not really knowing if this was true. And at some point over the years or decades, you finally surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. And then there's still others of us who maybe here are watching online, and you've never made that journey at all. In fact, you wouldn't even say you struggle with doubt. For you, it's a foregone conclusion. There's just no way this can be real. There's just too many good reasons to not believe in Jesus. And if you feel that way, I, I hope and I pray this comforts you. But even committed Christians sometimes wonder if this is real. There are some Christians who went in and came out of the pandemic with not only their faith intact, but they've never been more on fire for Jesus. And honestly, thank the Lord. Wonderful. But there are some people, maybe here or watching online, you know who you are, and you went into the pandemic wondering if it was real, but not paying too much attention to it, and then coming out of the pandemic thinking, oh my God, where have you been? Like, where have you honestly been? You've come out the other side wondering, have I wasted two, three, 10, 20 years of my life in this thing called Christianity? Because today you're just filled with doubt and confusion. And I hope at the very least, you know, when we read this passage, it, it communicates to you that Jesus is not afraid of honest doubt. In fact, he's having a full-blown conversation with people who don't believe. He is interacting with people who do not believe in him. He is trying to reason with people who do not believe in him. He is not afraid of their doubt. He is not afraid of their confusion. God is not afraid of your confusion, nor is he afraid of your honest doubts. But as I read this passage, I, I did wonder... Were the doubts of the Pharisees actually honest doubt? Like w when you read this, the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. So Deuteronomy 17, you need two or three witnesses. So is that, is that really the issue? Like, is there some sort of a legal technicality that there's not enough witnesses there? Like, I mean, how many disciples were there? 12, right? So there's at least 12 people there, right? I mean, Jesus had just fed 5,000 people, and in that time period, they didn't always count the women and children, so they only counted the men. So realistically, when he supernaturally fed 5,000 people, many scholars agree it could have been upwards of 20,000 people. You think somebody who got a free lunch might have said, y'all be a witness. You think it was possible for him to find two, maybe three people in a crowd of thousands who have seen miracles? Yeah, probably. But was it about the number of witnesses? Would, would a higher number of witnesses have convinced the Pharisees? And you don't even need to put yourself in their shoes. You can just ask yourself, how likely are you to be convinced that the things you believe are not true? Like, how many witnesses would it take? Anybody here watch the news? Anybody? Any news watchers? Yeah? How many witnesses would it take for me to convince you that where you watch the news is actually fake news? Give me a number. That's not zero. <laughs> no, I, I'm, but honestly, how, how many would it take? How many witnesses would it take for me to convince you that this is wherever you watch your news is fake news and this other channel or this other website, this is actually real news? Is there any number of witnesses I could provide? Is there any number of pieces of evidence that I could provide to convince you you're actually wrong about politics? I mean, we won't take it up a notch to God and life and you know, the heaven and hell. That's, that's the big stuff. Politics is small potatoes compared to the big stuff. So just sticking with the small potatoes, is there anything I could say to convince you that this political party is actually the right party and the one you vote for and believe in blah, 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 is the wrong party? Is there anything I could say? Honestly, how likely are you to be convinced that the things you believe are not actually true? How likely were the Pharisees? See, the whole point of the passage was that Jesus was the light of life, the light of something new that he was doing, 
starting with the cross, the, the, the big wide open door of forgiveness open to all who want to receive and, and, and this incredible life afterwards. And yet in light of all that he offered, these Pharisees just could not allow themselves to even come to the possibility that they were wrong for a lot of reasons, by the way. I mean, when you look at their lives, I mean, these are, these are the leaders of Israel, political power, emotional power, position, wealth. Their old lives were really, really good. And they never once realized that keeping your old life may cost you your new life. One of the hardest parts about my job is watching people choose not to let go of things that are destroying their lives and all I can do is just helplessly watch this life spiral into destruction. I've been here a year and seven months, feels longer, and uh, as I was uh, praying over this message, I was just reflecting on all the, the glory stories I've shared. And I, honestly, I've got a lot more. Uh, I've just been so blessed to see God move wonderfully in people's lives. I, just being a young adults pastor, more often than not, uh, they've been young people. And it's been honestly one of the great joys of our life to see young people's lives transformed. And, and at, least, at least in our context, like, I mean, it wasn't just like they were transformed, but then they meet someone, they get married. Like, you know, you lead them to the Lord, and then you baptize them, and then you do the marriage counseling, and then you marry them, and then you dedicate their kids. Like, and we have these memories of doing all this with couples, you know, in, in varying stages. And, and so I've got, you know, and I've got more, and I, I mark down what story I tell you, so I don't tell you the same ones twice. So I've got more stories, the true stories. But unfortunately... I actually have a lot more stories of people who walked away from the light. Those who walked away from this, this new thing that God wanted to do in their lives. And every time, I was helpless to watch. And, and I don't think I'm the only one. I think you probably have someone in your life who you love desperately. And, and don't you just wish, like if, if life was like you know driving a car, don't you just wish you could just, you know, stop their car, whoever they are for you, take them out of the driver's seat, throw them in the trunk, and close the trunk, and get in the, behind the wheel and say, you know what, I don't care about your will and about your comfort. You're not driving towards these drugs. You're not driving towards these people who are ruining your life. You're going to drive towards an education. You're going to drive towards a great job. You're going to drive towards a great relationship, even if it kills you. Like, don't you just wish you can, you know, force that to happen? But you can't. They have to learn for themselves like we all do, that new often requires you to let go of what you're used to. You have to leave it behind, to leave that thought process behind, to leave that mentality and those habits behind, even if it costs you. There are a lot of practical reasons why the Pharisees really struggled. And, and we'll touch on it again in a few moments. You know, just their position, the wealth, the power. Their old lives were really, really good. And how, how could they not be? And while all those reasons were valid, are valid, and maybe even you can resonate with some of those reasons, there's another reason that Jesus gave that if someone had told me that's the reason why I struggle with what God wants to do, I feel like I would be insulted. I, I might even leave the church. You would never do that, right? Pastor says something challenging. I'm going to, no, you're too mature for that. But, but this is the other reason. This is the other reason. And, and he's, he's saying this to, to religious leaders. You are of your father, the devil. <laughs> Whoa. Like, whoa, whoa, we'll talk about a, a line-crossing statement, right? And your will is to do your father's desire. Now, was he calling them evil? Absolutely not. Did he love them? Unequivocally, in ways we can't even imagine. But because he loved them, he had to say what he saw was happening in the unseen, because what was happening in their unseen happens in our unseen all the time. Their will was inconspicuously being kidnapped from right underneath their noses. 
Satan took what they thought was right and used it as an opportunity to gain a foothold in their life. Oh, so many people think that could never happen to me. I know the Bible like so well, so well. John 3, 16, I got it tattooed back there somewhere, right? My parents go to church. My grandmommy, my grandpappy go to church. My kids go to church. Yeah, the, the Pharisees could have said all the same. But they were convinced they were right. And Satan used that as an opportunity to gain a foothold in their life. He convinced them that that which was right, or wrong, sorry, was actually right. And, and it's kind of an MO for him, isn't it? Like with Adam and Eve, he, he convinced them that something that was wrong, disobeying God, was actually right. When I think of some of the things my kids are learning today, you know, things that are actually wrong, but they're being told it's actually right. And I'm thinking, like, what, <laughs> have I been asleep? Like, how, like where, did this, where is this coming from? And that's what he does. He, he tricks. He tricks you by trying to confuse you. How, how, do you, how do you know you've been tricked? How do you know that, that maybe that thing you, you think you're so sure about, maybe you shouldn't, shouldn't be so sure about? And as a follower of Christ, here's what I do. And not everyone has to do it. But I take what I think is right, and I hold it up to the words of life. That's what I do. And if there is an incongruency... Instead of throwing this book away, or at least what it represents, I start challenging my assumptions. I, heaven forbid, doubt my doubts. Now, I, I start becoming open to their possibility that maybe there's something I'm wrong about. To maybe let go. To, to maybe bring in some deeper Christian themes, this idea of letting go and admitting that maybe you're not right and that maybe your, your motives are not as pure as, as they, you think they are, uh, the word for that is humility. It's being humble enough to admit that I'm not sure all my thoughts about God are what I think they are, that maybe I've misjudged him. Because oftentimes we judge according to the flesh, don't we? Another word that, that flows out of humility is this idea of surrender. It's almost a swear word in our culture, isn't it? The idea of surrender and submission. But as followers of Christ, we embrace surrender because we know there's something better on the other side of surrender. In, uh, in the some of the circles that I walk and talk in, the idea of surrender is seen as foolish, is seen as intellectual abandonment, is seen as um, immature. And in some of those circles that I walk and talk in, the idea of applying doubt and confusion to Christianity is seen as the intellectual high ground. That because I have surrendered my life to Christ, I can't be that smart. Not that I am, but that's just the implication. That because I've, I've put my faith in him, that I, I must be an unsophisticated individual. When in reality, I think the, ac the exact opposite is true. Our faith is not bereft of logic and reason. In fact, I think there are incredibly good reasons to believe. And when I was like a young adult and youth pastor, like I would often invite people for coffee and say, hey, well, tell me. Tell me why you don't believe. Let's talk about it. M maybe you're right. Maybe you're not. Are, are you at least willing to have a I, the, I will buy. The church always bought. But I will buy coffee. Come on, let's at least talk. And so, now, and I won't go too much into this, some of the circles I walk and talk in. Uh, I do think that for some people, and me included at times, the doubt and the confusion was real. Absolutely real. 
But when I think about the lives of the Pharisees and the, the tactics of their questions and their refusal to believe, when I just see them, their confusion and doubt wasn't this honest doubt. It was just a way to maintain control of their lives. I mean, they were, in a lot of ways, the political and institutional and emotional leaders of Israel. I mean, think about that. Think about somebody who wields political power, institutional power, and emotional power over people. Like, I would think that would be intoxicating. I, I, I hope not, but I hope our leaders today who wield political power and institutional power and emotional power over people. I, I certainly hope they're not intoxicated by their positions because that would suck for us, wouldn't it, right? But I would think that it would be. Uh, e even, even pride can be intoxicating, can it? To be enamored with your position and your opinions and your status and your wealth and your position. And, and the stuff of life. And yet, even despite all that, within the crowd, there were many who believed. Well, what did they believe? Like, what was so compelling that Jesus did? And the part that we didn't read was right at the very beginning of chapter 8. We started at verse 12. A woman who was caught in adultery was brought before Jesus. And these same Pharisees were trying to trick him, saying, well, what do we do, Jesus? And maybe you remember these famous words. Even if you don't go to church, you, you, might, you might call them to mind. Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. They believed in the one who offered forgiveness for someone's most shameful moment. They believed in the one who gave a second chance when no one else would. They believed in the one whose words and life had the power of light and life and the power to set people free. If you were not living in forgiveness, in mercy, in grace, in truth, and love before the pandemic, then I urge you, I implore you, borderline beg you, do not go back to your pre-pandemic life because coming out of the pandemic, you can walk in forgiveness. You can walk in the new life that he has in store for you. You can walk in a second chance, a third chance, and a fourth chance because his mercy is new each and every morning. His grace does not run out. You can walk in a kind of truth that can set you free from the lies that are designed to destroy you. You can walk in a light that lights the path of your life so that you know where you come from, you know why you're here, and you know where you're going. We're going to take communion in just a couple of minutes here, and... It's odd because, I, you know, I, I started coming to church. Please don't judge me, but I think I took communion before I believed. I think there's grace for that, isn't there? Is that, amen? There is. And, uh, and the scriptures say, do this in remembrance of me. And that is 100% true. But... I feel like sometimes in church as Christians, we, we overemphasize the remembrance without realizing the implication of what communion means. We're not just remembering he forgave me. I'm living in it now. That's what it represents. It doesn't just represent what he did. It represents the fact that I'm going to live in what he did until the day I see him face to face where we will then together have communion, what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. We don't just remember the second chance he gave us on the cross. We're living in it today. 
We don't just remember the fact that he gives you the strength you need to overcome. We can live in that strength today. And so as we take communion in just a few moments, I know we remember what he did, but are you walking in it? Because if you were not walking in it before the pandemic, then dear God, do not go back to your pre-pandemic life. He's here to offer a light that gives you the power you need to live free from darkness. Don't just remember it, live in it. I'm gonna invite you to stand. We're gonna take communion before we worship. This is the bread which represents his body. Break it, remember what he did, but remember in light of this reality, I'm, I'm walking and living in what he did. In the same way, Jesus took the cup of the new covenant. And before you take this, ask yourself, where do you need his light, his love, his mercy, his grace to shine? Don't just remember what he gave you, live in it every day. Let's take together. Hallelujah, we worship you, Lord. We worship you. I wanted to share three thoughts with you in closing before we worship, just kind of real quickly here. How do, you, how do you live in this? Will you listen deeply? Jesus said so many words that these Pharisees couldn't hear. He's here today, church, and he's been speaking. The Spirit of God is moving. Wherever you are, even in the world right now, the Spirit of God is at work. Are you listening deeply? Are you walking faithfully? even when it's scary. There's a light in front of you that like the Israelites, you may not understand, but it's leading you and guiding you to something new. And lastly, ask desperately, not in the sense of begging, but just passionately, believing that he who loves you is going to reach out to you. That he who loves you longs to shine in your life. He who loves you longs to give you the truth that has the power to set you free. That he who loves you longs to shower his mercy over you, which is new each and every day. And whatever your reasons may be the doubt, I pray that his love and his light would just wash away that doubt that you would see, not necessarily why you should believe, but how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. Regardless of what you've done, he loves you. And whether you realize it or not, you need him. You need him more than you'll ever know. So Father, as we worship today, as we declare, God, our need for you, I pray, oh Lord, that whatever doubts exist, that you would wash them away. God, that you would help me to see who you are. Father, I bring those confusions to you. You are not afraid of the reasons why I don't believe. But God, just as you met those Pharisees, just as you met those who believed, I pray, God, that you would meet us here today and you would allow faith to rise up in our lives. For those who struggle with believing, God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. I pray, God, for those who believe but just aren't sure, I pray, God, that today would be a step of faith. For those, God, who are believing for your touch in the life of a loved one, I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would shine your light and that you would do something new. We need you, Lord. We need you in Jesus' name. Church, let's worship today. Let's declare our need for him to do something incredible. Amen. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here 
today you would say, you know, I just need someone to pray for me. I, I, I need him to do something in my life in this area. Maybe you need prayer on behalf of someone else and you need God to move in the life of someone you love, the life of a prodigal loved one who for whatever reason just won't believe. Maybe, maybe you feel like you've done something that's unforgivable. And yet that's the great truth of Christianity that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from or what you've done, but there's forgiveness and you just need to be reminded of that in prayer. If you need prayer this morning, I'm gonna pray and dismiss you, but if you need prayer, come on up. We got Pastor Kevin, Nick, you've been minted. Come on, we'll pray. We will pray and just believe together. 
that God's still in the business of doing new things. Even in the lives of people who we feel are a million miles away from grace, he is moving. Amen, church, he's moving. So, Father, I just pray that uh, those who need to go, God, bless them and keep them and cause your face to shine on them. But, Lord, for those who need a special touch from you here or online with our online prayer team, Father, I pray that you would move in a mighty way. We know that you're speaking. Just as you were speaking to the Pharisees, just as you spoke to the crowds, we know, God, that through the power of your presence, you are here in this place speaking. And so, Father, we want to take a moment to listen what you want to say, what you want to declare over our lives, our homes, and our loved ones. Lord, we come to declare we need you. So, Lord, for those who go, bless them. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, don't forget about our missions meeting, small groups and seniors. They're going to keep playing. If you need prayer today, come on up. Uh, no shame, no embarrassment. We're pastors. This is what we do. We pray. So come on up. We have Nick here with Pastor Kevin. I'm here as well. If you need prayer, come on up. We want to pray with you. If you have to get going, the Lord bless you, and we'll see you next week.